welcome. As we have already heard today, there have been some amazing advances with the advent of PARP inhibitors and a promising new treatment for platinum resistant ovarian cancer. In this session, we are gonna be talking about an important area of unmet need, rare ovarian cancers. High-grade serous carcinoma is the most common subtype of ovarian cancer, and it is generally considered to make up about 75% of ovarian cancer cases. That remaining 25% of rare ovarian cancer subtypes often gets overlooked in terms of awareness, fundraising, research, support, and more. Um, today, we've brought together an incredible panel of global experts and patient advocates um, from the rare ovarian cancer community. And they are gonna be sharing some of the key challenges and opportunities for these rare ovarian cancer subtypes. My name is Jennifer Garum. I'm going to be moderating this panel today. I am an ovarian cancer survivor and advocate, and I'm also a journalist. I was diagnosed with um, stage 3C ovarian cancer in October of 2018 and I completed active treatment in April of 2019 um, and I had high-grade serous carcinoma. Uh, as a journalist, since my ovarian cancer diagnosis, I've shifted to focus primarily on topics related to cancer in my writing and I'm a regular contributor uh, to the website Everyday Health. And now I'd like to introduce you to our incredible panel. And uh, I will start with Dr. David Gershenson. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, so I'm a professor and former chair of the Department of Gynecologic Oncology and Reproductive Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And my major career focus has been on the clinical and translational research of rare ovarian cancers. I've had several national or international uh, positions, including chair of the NRG Oncology Rare Tumor Committee, co-chair of the National Cancer Institute's um, Gynecologic Cancer Steering Committee, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Gynecologic Oncology, and president of the Society of Gynecologic Oncology and the American Radium Society. And finally, I've, uh, I'm currently the chair of the International Consortium for the study of low-grade serous ovarian cancer. So thank you. I'm glad to be here. Hi, thanks. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Rob Hollis. I'm a research scientist working on ovarian cancer at the Cancer Research UK Scotland Centre uh, based at the University of Edinburgh. So I'm an early career research fellow. Um, so I've got an early career fellowship, which really um, is a position that bridges between working as a research scientist in um, a laboratory uh, towards actually leading my own research. Uh, to date, most of my work is really focused on uh, molecular profiling of tumor samples. Uh, this has been um, a lot of gene sequencing work, but also looking at patterns of how tumors use genes and proteins and what these really mean in terms of um, their clinical behavior of tumors. <laughs> In terms of rare ovarian cancers, um, a lot of the work that I've done is focused on endometrioid ovarian cancer and low-grade serous ovarian cancer, uh, and more recently in ovarian carcinoma sarcoma, uh, but I've done a small amount of work in mucinous and clear cell ovarian cancer as well. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the, the invite, and I'm kind of really looking forward to having um, rare ovarian tumors at kind of the forefront of a specific discussion. So my name's Jane Ludeman and I'm speaking to you from my home in New Zealand. I was diagnosed with a rare ovarian cancer called low-grade serous in 2017 and I've been on treatment ever since. I'm the founder of Cure Our Ovarian Cancer. We're New Zealand's only ovarian cancer charity, but I'm here today because of the work we've done internationally to help women with low-grade serous carcinoma support research on their cancer and access good information to improve their care. By thinking strategically and acting intentionally, we've been able to create some sizable change in this community, uh, despite being a very small cancer a charity on the other side of the world. And so I through this work have become really aware that it's not just our type of ovarian cancer, but a lot of the issues affect 
uh, all rare ovarian cancers. So I really look forward to sharing some of the insights we've learned along the way and hope that we can all make a difference to rare ovarian cancers today. Hi, I'm Sarah. Thank you for having me. Um, so I was diagnosed with mucinous ovarian cancer um, just over two years ago at the age of 25. Um, mucinous ovarian cancer is very rare. It represents around 3% of women. Um, it's very different to the subtypes. Um, and because of this, it has a very low response rate to standard ovarian cancer treatment. But because of the lack of research, there isn't anything evidence-based to suggest a better therapy for us. So the standard is used, but with very little response. Um, so this prompted me to start the MOP project, which is an initiative that aims to make ovarian cancer research more inclusive of mucinous ovarian cancer. At, currently in the UK, there's no research into mucous ovarian cancer, no scientists actively looking into it. Um, so we're trying to get the scientific community more interested. So we've, over the past year, started fundraising. We managed to fundraise around 60,000, which is good. <laughs> um, so we started talks with other ovarian cancer charities to represent us and to see if they would um, do a grant that's specific for mucinous um, and then we're going to put the money to that and hopefully that will be the first research in over 10 years into mucinous. <laughs> thank you. So thank you all. I'm excited to have you on this panel and um, we're going to kick off this session with a presentation from Dr. David Gershenson, who will be providing an overview of um, the rare ovarian cancers as well as some of the key challenges and opportunities in this area. I'm going to talk a little bit about rare ovarian cancers and uh, tell you that every challenge represents a great opportunity. I think one of the most important uh, features of this is that not all ovarian cancers are created equal. And so one size certainly does not uh, fit all women who have ovarian cancer. This is a modified uh, World Health Organization classification of ovarian tumors. It doesn't include all of them, but it includes many of the important rare ovarian cancers. And so what you see is that some of these are rare, others are very rare, and yet others are exceedingly rare. We know that rare ovarian cancers differ tremendously. Each one is unique. And so they differ in uh, their incidence and their prevalence. So more indolent or slow growing tumors may have a higher prevalence than more aggressive tumors. Each one of them has a very characteristic histology or microscopic appearance. Uh, the molecular profile is different for each one of these, the state, as is the stage distributions. And the clinical behavior and prognosis for each one of these tumors is very different. And that uh, translates into much different treatments for many of these rare types. So these are the rare epithelial ovarian cancers. Uh, Jennifer mentioned high-grade serous, which is the most common and not considered rare, but the rare types are low-grade serous, endometrioid, mucinous, and clear cell, and you can see what their uh, frequencies are here as well. I mentioned that they differ tremendously in terms of their uh, molecular biology, so you can again see for the for high-grade serous, the most common versus the rare epithelial ovarian subtypes. Um, this is a slide that shows you that different histologies or different subtypes of uh, ovarian cancer respond differently to different modalities of treatment. Uh, this just shows you the level of expertise for rare ovarian tumors from a general practitioner to specialist to subspecialist to an expert. And I consider an expert to be a subset generally, of either gynecologic oncologists or medical oncologists who treat patients with these rare ovarian cancers. So if you're looking for a second opinion or consultation to obtain expertise, you really want to search for that subset of uh, physicians who, who specialize or subspecialize in that area. These are some of the keys to the optimal outcomes for women with rare ovarian tumors. For women who are newly diagnosed, certainly seeking out a gynecologic oncologist at a high volume center for primary surgery is really key 
in terms of comprehensive surgical staging for early disease and maximal cytoreduction for women who have advanced stage disease. And then very importantly, there are many young women who have early stage disease who may be candidates for, for fertility sparing surgery. It's important also to note that the pathology of rare ovarian tumors can be quite difficult to diagnose. And so referral to a gynecologic pathologist who is, has expertise in a particular type is really key. And then seeking uh, second opinions from experts at the time of either primary diagnosis, as I mentioned, or particularly relapse, to know what are the treatment options, what are the clinical trials and potentially available for your subtype is really important. Finally, uh, these are some of the challenges and barriers when we talk about rare ovarian cancers in terms of small numbers of cases, which impact the feasibility and design of clinical trials long accrual times on clinical trials because these are uncommon uh, tumors. There, there can be few inve uh, interested investigators, uh, much less attention by the scientific community, which also translates it into low funding priority from both federal agencies, foundations, and industry. There are generally fewer uh, patient advocates and a lack of standard bioinformatics that help us design clinical trials. These are some of the opportunities for progress in rare ovarian cancers, investigators partnering with strong patient advocacy groups, engaging pharmaceuticals and uh, other agencies to a much greater degree, continuing to mine the molecular biology of rare ovarian cancers because we really, I think, just scratched the surface in understanding the biology of these tumors developing an innovative clinical trials, which has occurred for some rare cancers, not others, and then establishing registries and biorepositories for these rare ovarian cancers. And many times that can emanate from the establishment of national uh, networks or consortium. Thank you for that overview. Um, I wanted to ask a couple questions. So first of all, you spoke about the keys to optimal outcome for women with rare ovarian cancers. And just to kind of narrow in on for, for like really salient information for say, like an ovarian cancer organization that is running a support group or a helpline and they get contacted by someone who is just diagnosed with a rare ovarian cancer, what are the key messages, the most important things for these organizations, the resources, messages for them to share? Because that's a critical moment and you shared there's things that can you could do at that moment for better outcomes. What should these organizations really hone in on if they're contacted by someone with a rare ovarian cancer? It's a great question, Jennifer. So the first thing I would say, as I mentioned briefly already, was if they're newly diagnosed, so they've either had an ultrasound or a CT scan that shows a, a mass in the abdomen or pelvis, or they've even had a biopsy, but they've not received any treatment, uh, these advocacy groups and organizations can help direct them to a gynecologic oncologist who would perform their primary surgery. And again, if they have early stage disease, comprehensive surgical staging is so important, as well as I mentioned, fertility sparing surgery for some young patients. If they have advanced stage disease, then uh, maximal side reduction to remove all of the gross tumor is very important. And then um, later on, if a patient uh, relapses, that is another time in the, her history when referral to an expert is really key to learn about all of the treatment options, uh, including clinical trials that may be available. This is really a crit of critical importance. And we see so many patients referred to us who really haven't received state-of-the-art information. So I think those are the, the things uh, particularly that these organizations can do. Great, thank you so much. And thank you also for highlighting the distinction between a specialist and an expert. I don't think that's like something that's obvious and I think it's really empowering information for people to know there could be a guidon, but then there could be guidons and who specialize in these rare subtypes and that's where they should be going for their treatment or their second opinions. Right. Um, you also highlighted as a, a key opportunity, investigators partnering with strong patient advocacy groups. And 
I believe you collaborate with Jane, who's also on this panel today, in this way with her or organization, Cure Our Ovarian Cancer. Um, so I was wondering if you could both speak to how investigators can connect with these patient advocacy groups in the rare ovarian cancer space, and what are some reasons that this is so important that, that they do? Yeah, so there, there, uh, there's a growing number of um, organizations, rare tumor advocacy groups who have websites like Jane or Facebook groups. And um, it's really important for investigators who are committed to the study and treatment of these rare ovarian cancers to connect with the, the patient advocacy groups. If there's not already a patient advocacy group for your particular uh, rare subtype, um, work with a, a physician or vice versa, physician con work with some of your patients who have that rare tumor to establish something like Jane has been able to do. Um, and I think the, the real key is once these partnerships are established, they can be so powerful and impactful in lobbying uh, regulatory agencies and pharmaceuticals to establish uh, national or international consortia uh, and networks. And so I think they can, they can do so much. And I think, again, we've really only scratched the surface in terms of the, the power of uh, many of these ad advocacy groups. It's such a great question, a, a really interesting question. And I think there are so many benefits that can come from the connections between the researchers working in this rare ovarian cancer space and the advocacy groups, because you're really working towards a common goal. I think uh, as a, if you are a rare ad, ovarian cancer advocacy group, I think the first thing really to do is to find the experts in your cancer and those researchers who really are playing a major role in it. And so we were very fortunate to establish a relationship with Dr. Gershenson and that's been incredibly um, fruitful for us. He recognized the potential of what we were proposing really early on and was able to facilitate introductions to other researchers around the world who were working in the space. And I think we really benefited a lot from his uh, from his goodwill and that bought us a lot of goodwill as well and help us get a foot in the door in places where we might not have otherwise and form connections through these researchers with other charities that we're willing to uh, support and help our work as well and from our perspective being an interface between the patients and the researchers it's really helped us understand as an organization where we need to focus and that work and to make sure that the work we're doing is that we're putting that effort in where it's needed. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, I have another question for you. Um, Dr. Gershenson mentioned fewer patient advocates uh, for rare ovarian cancers is one of the key challenges. Um, what do you think could be done to, to attract and unite more patient advocates for the rare ovarian cancer subtypes? I love this question, Jennifer. I think uh, the key to that really is, um, I'm a bit biased, but I think providing those connections, particularly not just thinking locally, but globally for rare ovarian cancer patients to find each other. And so I really would encourage organizations who aren't focusing on rare ovarian cancers to make an effort to make sure that the patients that they're supporting and working with also know about the existence of specific initiatives for their rare cancers because that's really how you know our numbers locally are quite small but globally uh, numbers certainly have much more scale and that's really I think how you create the environment where you can create patients can create their own change and I guess in our work it would have been so much harder to do this if there wasn't already a group of patients uh, around the world united on the internet through a Facebook support group and we had those connections which really um, which gave us a start and meant that we could build on that and I think 
collaboration is also really important. So we've been very fortunate to have some really great relationships with various ovarian cancer charities and cancer charities who've been very willing to share their knowledge and skills and work with us to help our rear ovarian cancer community and strengthen us as an organization. So that's definitely another area where it's organizations can add value by strengthening the initiatives and voices that are already out there. And lastly, I think I'd just say that genuine engagement is really important. These patients need more than just talk. Uh, the rear ovarian cancer community really needs allies and advocates and funding. Thank you so much, Jane. And that's an excellent point you made about just thinking globally when you're trying to connect mm. with other advocates. Because I think you're, as, you know, you're diagnosed with cancer, you might just think your community, your state, or even your country. But with the mm. rare ovarian cancers, you need to think globally. And then there is going to be a community of people. There are going to be others somewhere in the world that you can connect with. So yes. um, with that, I would like to lead into um, Jane will now be presenting about some of the funding around rare ovarian cancers. So today I'm just going to talk very briefly about some of the global inequities in rare ovarian cancer research funding. But before I start, I do just want to acknowledge that ovarian cancer research has been underfunded, and particularly from, from government and large nonprofit sources in regards to relative to its mortality, its lethality, if you want to look at uh, its incidence, um, its burden of disease, all of these measures. And in addition, I also want to acknowledge that ovarian cancer nonprofits really are underfunded as well. And so we are at a disadvantage as a whole community because of that underinvestment. And this slide's just to show really how those two things do combine. And so this is looking at the government funding and then the charitable funding and seeing just those huge gaps for ovarian cancer compared to some other common types of ovarian of uh, the cancers. And so this slide, uh, the square represents the um, the total funding for ovarian cancer and the yellow dots are the percentage of ovarian cancer uh, they represent that percentage of funding of rare ovarian cancer projects that were funded by the UK Medical Research Council over 22 years. And then those missing dots are really where if rare ovarian cancers were funded relative to their proportion, uh, where you would expect to see projects and, and we're not seeing them. So you can see that just 6% of funding of that ovarian cancer funding went to rare ovarian cancers and that's significantly less than what you would expect. And in fact, it was just two projects. So a clear cell project and a clear cell endometrioid. So you saw that long list of types of rare ovarian cancer by Dr. Gershenson, and you can see that lots just weren't even getting a look in. And then this is a data taken from the US. And so similar, the square represents the total amount of funding for ovarian cancer research. The yellow dots are the percentage that has gone to rare ovarian cancers and the missing dots are what you would expect to be seeing at least if it was funded to proportionality. I think I went about 20% on this diagram. And so in this case, there were a lot more projects being funded, which is great, but not, not a high frequency for any of these and still lots of missing rare ovarian cancers as well. So what does that really mean from the patient perspective? And I think that's really important to reflect on because I think part of the reason this has come about is because on a local sense, these cancers are rare. You as organizations might just be seeing a few people with all these different types and that can affect uh, the importance that sometimes gets put on these things. But when you look and you take even the the rarest of these ovarian cancers and you look 
at a global scale, the numbers of women being affected by these diseases is really significant. So for our low-grade serous community, we estimate that there's somewhere between 45,000 and 180,000 women currently living with this cancer. So that's large numbers, and it is really important for these communities that we do see progress in these areas and that their cancers do get funded and have this research funding because research is the only way that they get improvements in their outcomes and their survival. Um, I have a question regarding the disparities in funding. Um, it does seem like that is a huge challenge. What can be done in terms of getting more government funding and 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 more organizational funding? I mean, what are like some ideas for overcoming this obstacle? Yeah, so I think uh, the first thing to say is that if you're an advocacy organization, just one of the really easy things that you can do is just by start including these conversations around rare ovarian cancers in your advocacy work. Because if you're not speaking up for these cancers, who will? Uh, and so... As an example, in New Zealand, we recently made a submission to the New Zealand Parliament to try and improve the situation with ovarian cancer locally. And as part of that, we're trying to get dedicated research funding for ovarian cancer. And so we made sure in our report, when we spoke about research, we also included rare ovarian cancers and drew attention to those disparities and emphasized how important this particular area of research was and we will keep fighting for that to be included in any resulting research initiative that does eventuate because I think it's really clear looking at those statistics that I showed that if we don't these women do get left out so it is important to be intentional about that and to be talking about and mentioning these cancers and acknowledge those disparities and be really upfront about it in your conversations with governments, I think. And if anyone wants a copy of our report, very happy to share it and the information that we have in it with anyone if they get in touch. If you're a research organization, I think the thing I'd really encourage you to do is, first of all, just take stock of the research that you've funded to date and maybe even calculate the percentage of rare ovarian cancer funding that you're doing to see how that does stack up. And what I would what I would challenge you to do is just really think about that if it's not at least equal with the prevalence in our community, uh, whether there are things that you could be doing to promote rare ovarian cancer research, whether that's talking to rare ovarian cancer researchers like Dr. Gershenson and Dr. Hollis to see how you can make your funding criteria more rare friendly, or if it's making sure that you potentially have some funding that is just set aside for rare ovarian cancer research. And I would say that this, this definitely is an issue that's really important to ovarian cancer charities, uh, especially because it's something that isn't currently on the radar of the other cancer funders, particularly government and general cancer charities. So I think it is really important that rare ovarian cancer charities do take a lead on this. And I would say that what you do and the choices you do really do matter. And even though these cancers might be rare in the area that you're operating, it is a big global community. And what you do can really make a huge difference for these patients and their outcomes. Great, thank you so much. Um, next, we're gonna have a presentation from Rob Hollis coming up uh, from the researcher perspective. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the challenges in rare ovarian cancer research, um, particularly in laboratory research. And here you can see um, some of the ovarian carcinoma types. And really all I want you to take away from this figure that's just popped up is that each kind of like row is kind of a different layer of molecular characterization. So really the message is that in ovarian cancer, research progress has been made, and we understand a lot about this common type, high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma, to the point where actually we're able to put on lots of layers of information to look at how different molecular changes interact with each other. And that kind of really allows us to 
move from a more simplistic view of the molecular landscape in these tumors, which I've just put above here, where in this pie chart, kind of almost every patient is assigned one like molecular group or molecular defect. And with kind of like the advanced knowledge that we have now, we're actually able to kind of come to this more complex view at the bottom where we actually see overlaps and interactions between molecular changes. In contrast, in the rarer ovarian cancer types, we don't have this kind of advanced understanding. In the context of low-grade serous ovarian cancer in Edinburgh, we're doing some work to look at using laboratory models of low-grade serous ovarian cancer cells that grow in the lab and testing about 2,000 drugs that are actually used in in either other cancers or other disease settings to see if any of those are actually good candidates for then using in low-grade serous cancer. And this is quite an attractive strategy because the fact that these agents are used in other settings means we know things like toxicity profiles and doses, and that kind of means that we can accelerate their progress for the most promising candidates towards clinical studies and, and getting some of these promising drugs into patients. So challenges in researching these rare tumors, we've talked quite a lot about limited funding, uh, but also really importantly, there's a limited pool of expertise in rare tumor types. And one of the kind of big challenges in, is in expanding that expertise. There are also challenges around the perceptions on the importance and impact of work, mainly around kind of the frequency at which some of these tumors arise. And especially from like a funding point of view, there's definitely kind of a, an issue with perception on the amount of impact that you can have when your research is applicable to um, a smaller population of patients than one of the larger kind of um, patient groups. And kind of compounding all this is really um, a lack of fundamental knowledge. So kind of a basic biological understanding of um, some of these tumor types. So here's that basic view of high-grade serous that I talked about. And by comparison, I've just put up a basic view of low-grade serous cancer. So there has been um, work in this field as Dr. Gershenson described before, but actually you can see the whole kind of left-hand side of this pie chart is still kind of an unknown and a question mark. A comparative view for Carson's sarcoma is essentially just one big question mark. So you can really see here that there are very large gaps in knowledge, and it's very difficult to then kind of um, advance towards whether it's new agents or more advanced molecular understanding of these tumors when we don't have that fundamental knowledge in place. To kind of focus in on funding challenges, obviously the importance of funding, uh, funding is what kind of powers the research, it's what buys the, you know, the lab equipment, the reagents that we use to study. Um, to study these um, tumors. Uh, I want to highlight that kind of ring fence funding for specific topics really drives progress in those topics. So kind of ring fence funding for specific rare ovarian cancer types is an opportunity to really drive progress there. I kind of mentioned the importance of funding for training the next generation. And really the, the counterbalance for investing that funding is that actually if you can get people interested very, very early on in rare ovarian cancers, then you're kind of training expertise for a whole future career. So that can be really fruitful. Uh, so in terms of rare diseases being perceived as less impactful, this really highlights the huge importance of patient advocates. For ovarian cancer-specific funding sources, this is one way that can kind of contribute to an environment of, of competition in research instead of cooperation. Um, so that's really something to bear in mind. Uh, I talked a little bit about lack of fundamental knowledge and really in terms of translating findings into small patient populations, like kind of Jane really touched on really nicely is that you have to think globally in terms of international collaboration to make things like um, disease specific trials possible in this setting. So uh, early career researchers, uh, it's a period of real kind of enthusiasm and creativity. And actually, they have maybe a kind of logistical advantage that often uh, we aren't overrun with other kind of academic commitments. One of the disadvantages of ECRs is that we have a very limited time to kind of demonstrate our potential to lead uh, our own science. This means that we require a lot of support. And this can be quite difficult in rare ovarian cancers where expertise is overall quite limited and tends to kind of like uh, gravitate towards each other in, in centers of excellence. But something to really bear in mind is that actually the rare ovarian cancer field is competing with other tumor types, including high-grade serous carcinoma for kind of the best early career researchers. So key opportunities to kind of seize, I think the biggest is really getting people interested early in their careers. 
Uh, securing ring fence funding for specific rare ovarian cancer types, I think, is a big priority. And we need to really be thinking about attracting a range of expertise. Uh, international networks of researchers are super, super important. We talked a little bit about international consortia on specific rare ovarian cancer types. These are a huge opportunity to kind of focus and prioritize work, to organize, to make sure that we're not duplicating work so that we're making the most out of the resource that we do already have. Uh, and I'm going to leave you there. Great. Thank you so much. It sounds like the a really strong message is like collaboration and uniting because then like to Jane's point, while it might be rare locally, globally, there's more strength in, in uniting. So um, Rob, I had a question for you. You talked about the, a challenge as just being able to convey the importance and the impact of this research and how are some ways, um, you know, I know we, we talked offline about um, disproportionately younger women are impacted by rare ovarian ovarian cancers and so that amounts to more loss of years of life and can you talk about that and, and that impact yes i think it's it's really important um that um if we acknowledge that these diseases are all separate and they do have different features and think about actually how we can make it clear what the area of need is so um low-grade serous carcinoma is a really excellent example that um, you know, is an uncommon tumor type um, and uh, can sometimes be described as kind of like a favorable prognosis group of ovarian cancers or an indolent group of ovarian cancers because of their behavior. But actually, when you when you kind of look at them, these are much, much younger women when they're diagnosed. And actually, the, the relapse and recurrence rate in mortality is, is actually very, is actually still high. Um, and, you know, a lot of that kind of long survival time compared to maybe high-grade serous carcinoma is um, a lot of that for many patients is post-relapse. You're actually still in um, kind of a, a state of disease burden. So this kind of like maybe oversimplification um, can be a problem. So we really need to think about specific ovarian cancer types. What are, um, you know, almost like the unique selling points of each tumor type and what are the needs for that tumor type? Uh, something that scientists maybe aren't amazingly good at, especially if they're um, more fundamental biologists and translational scientists, is, is thinking about the human element of our research. Um, so engaging with patient advocacy groups um, to kind of teach us almost about the disease that we're working on um, is so important. And that kind of interaction both with, with patient advocates and with academic clinicians is, is so, so important for being able to kind of formulate a case for, for bringing that funding in and for showing how impactful the research can be. Great. Thank you so much. And actually, that is the perfect transition to, I want to talk to Sarah about the patient perspective a little bit. Um, I want you, so you were diagnosed with mucinous ovarian cancer. What did it feel like? to be doing research and finding relative to other cancers, there wasn't much going on in the research and maybe not, nothing at all in, in some respects. Yeah, as I was waiting for my stage in surgery, I wanted to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So I researched a lot and it was just nothing. No current research. And then it really sprung on me how dire the situation would be if it wasn't localized um and I think it's just devastating because you feel like you don't have this support system and then when you turn to ovarian cancer charities and you aren't being represented you just feel very isolated and you feel like you're being left out is the easiest way to put it you know why doesn't anyone care because I am a young woman, we all have families. My life is just as much worth as someone else's. Yeah, um, I was wondering too, because you, a lot of people get diagnosed with cancer, but not everyone starts an initiative. You started the MOP project. What yeah. made you do that? What was like the moment that inspired you? Like you saw the research, you were looking online, you saw that there was real area of need, but what, what prompted you to take action? Yeah, so I was really lucky in a sense that I was diagnosed stage 1C, um, which means um, that the tumour ruptured as it was being taken out. Um, but 
and all the washings were negative, etc. And when I got that news, I just thought of all the women that aren't as lucky. So who are diagnosed at stage three or four and with mucinous ovarian cancer, the prognosis is a lot worse than the more common subtypes because of the lack of treatment options. And I just felt that I needed to represent them and I had a responsibility to give them a fair chance of beating this disease. Thank you so much. Um, a question for both for you and for Jane. As a rare ovarian cancer patient and survivor, um, how do you feel when you reach out to support groups or see that there's not enough funding um, in, or that there needs to be so much more? Yeah, I think um, it is really difficult when you're, when you're diagnosed as Sarah just spoke to. Um, it, it's not something that I'd wish on, on anyone. I still remember that day that I went into a research database to find out how much research was being published on my cancer in, a, in an entire year. And there were, 20 papers and I looked up breast cancer and it was almost 12,000 and you it, it really Sarah is so right it really was devastating because you have this realization that women really you know a lot of women are dying from this disease at very young ages and these women are going to if nothing changes, that these women will keep dying in 10, 20, 50 years time. And so I think like Sarah, I felt really motivated to, to create change for me as well. Um, so that if I need more treatments that they might be there for me, but also for that broader community, because you do see just the huge toll that it does take on people. And you know, I thought things were bad for low-grade Sarahs, and, and they are really quite. But um, when you contacted me, Sarah, and then we tried to find, we couldn't find a single researcher in the UK working on your cancer. And, and you know, it actually, for the first time, it made me very grateful that that we had won. <laughs> so um, it's, it is it is a very, I think people just don't really understand those huge disparities and gaps and I think that's it's been great to have this conversation today about that because we've heard from Rob about all those unknowns we've heard from Dr. Gershenson about all those challenges and uh, how they are all different diseases that need their own specific inputs and when you have all those question marks in the research setting does make it really hard for patients because your doctor is saying to you we don't actually know what's best we don't know how to treat this there's all these unknowns because this information hasn't been found out and so it really it impacts you right the way through and in, in pretty much every aspect of your care mm. um before we share some resources about connecting with uh, rare patients diagnosed with rare ovarian cancer uh, and how they can connect, Sarah, um, I had a question for you. How are you reaching out and connecting with other people diagnosed with mucinous? Like what exactly are you doing to connect with these other women? So at first it was all over social media because it is so rare um, it's hard to find people locally. Um, so the online support groups um, and then people have connected um, with me through my social media um, but in terms of ovarian cancer charities they'll have a rare ovarian cancer support group but it won't necessarily be mucinous so I think having that divide can help you find allies as you're going through it. Yes, because as the you know researchers, scientists, doctors today in the panel shared, they're all different diseases. They get treated differently. You need support and you need connection with people who can advise you and get, you know hear what you're going through who are specific yeah. to your type. Yeah, and it's it's actually quite scary with mucinous. So on the Facebook support group, we're all treated differently because there isn't that standard care treatment. Some of us will have chemo, some of us won't, and then that gives you doubt in confidence which is yeah so even though the support groups are great with mucinous it does create that 
am I being treated the same? Is that the right thing? Is that the wrong thing? So, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that just speaks to that, you know, message of uniting efforts, whether it's researchers, doctors, patients, just like uniting and, and sharing information. Um, and now just as we finish up, um, Jane is going to share some resources, um, some helpful resources uh, for um, ovarian cancer organizations um, about to connect others with rare ovarian cancer subtypes and, um, and these resources are going to be shared now through the slide. They're also going to be available on this platform after, so you can still access it after this presentation is over. Thank you so much. I've put together a slide just with uh, some of the rare ovarian cancer resources and initiatives and support groups that exist out there. Uh, Facebook support groups are really uh, a big place for the rare ovarian cancer community to congregate, but there are also a lot of um, charities and organizations dedicated specifically to rare ovarian cancers around the world as well. And I do apologize to any rare ovarian cancer charities uh, if I've missed anyone off here. These are just the ones that I personally am aware of. And finally, for a takeaway, I just really want to emphasize that this is a big area and there are things that we can all do collectively that add up to significant change for women with rare ovarian cancers. So these are just some, some very easy starting points. Uh, and I think the most important thing is for organizations to be thinking about rare ovarian cancers, to have that awareness of these disparities that exist and look for opportunities to make a difference. Uh, in particular, one super easy thing you can do is talk about the subtypes. So, you know, most of the public don't realize that ovarian cancer is a different disease, but I tell you what, there are women in the ovarian cancer community who don't realize that their ovarian cancer is different to other ovarian cancers. And particularly for rare ovarian cancers where the information there isn't as much information as available uh, by including subtypes in your communication and saying that when you share a story this is someone with clear cell ovarian cancer or if you're talking about research you're funded or research in the news that this is a high-grade serous and high-grade endometrial project uh, to to help those patients get that richness of information so that they can put it in context of how what they're seeing and that information really applies to them and building up that awareness that ovarian cancer isn't one cancer, it is lots of different diseases and they're all really important. Uh, in particular, as we talked about before, connecting rare ovarian cancer patients. So I think it's important to think not just within your local community, but also that global community, because these are very different diseases and helping these cancer patients get the scale that they need and have those connections so that they can share information and create an environment where they're really empowered to create change within their cancer as well and, and supporting that connection. And finally, you know, if you are an advocacy organization, please do include rare ovarian cancers specifically in your advocacy. Uh, we know when they're not mentioned, they tend to get left out. So it is important to really be talking about this community and, and advocating for that funding, especially for research. And if you are funding research, please do go in and, and take a look at what you're funding and do consider ways that you can adjust your grants criteria perhaps um, to be more amenable to be funding some of this more basic research where there are just huge gaps because that information doesn't exist or uh, preferably as well, making dedicated rare ovarian cancer research grants available too so that we can improve and get progress in these disease communities and make a difference for all women. And I think, you know, the World Ovarian Cancer Coalition says it very well when it's leave no woman behind. And that's really uh, what we hope to, to really take across today. So thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, right before we wrap up, I just want to go around to all the panelists, ask a really quick question. If each of you could just say one thing, um, what is your ideal vision 
for the future of rare ovarian cancers? And what would you like to see change in this landscape? Just one thing um, that you wanna leave the viewers with. Um, and I'll start with Dr. Gershenson. Oh, thank you. So my vision is for uh, significantly improved treatment options for women with all of these uh, rare types of ovarian cancer. And as all the speakers have said, the main way to, to get at that is with better funding. Uh, and then I just let me make one other point, and that is I would really like to see the advocacy groups play a much larger role in influencing the decision makers. So in the USA, for instance, that would be the FDA, the National Cancer Institute, and also all of, of the pharmaceuticals. And so I think that that really needs to occur on a much larger scale. Great. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, I guess I want to, as a scientist, want to see, you know, a much, much greater understanding of each of these rare tumor types and to see that understanding really translate into effective treatment options so that, um, I mean, uh, Dr. Gershenson um, presented some kind of like treatment flow um, diagrams. We really want to see, you know, detailed diagrams for every rare tumor type that don't all look the same. Um, to talk about kind of like the, the major advances that have been made in terms of treating um, ovarian cancer, they have been fundamentally driven by our knowledge of how these tumors work. And so filling in that knowledge to kind of like get that piece of the puzzle to move on to then translating that into getting effective treatments into women, regardless of how common their diagnosis is. Thank you so much. Jane? Yeah, so I mean, I think the ideal would be as a rare ovarian cancer patient to be diagnosed and to be diagnosed correctly and see a doctor who has an awareness of the specific treatments for your cancer and gives you that best standard of care and for that best standard of care to be effective so that you are in a situation where you're being told, actually, we know how to treat this and we can give you this treatment and this treatment is going to work. I think uh, that's really what we we want to see. And, and research is so fundamental to getting there um, and having that investment in rare ovarian cancer research. Great. Thank you so much. And Sarah, for your ideal vision, what would you like to see happen for rare ovarian cancers? So my ideal vision is for each ovarian cancer type to be treated as separate entities not all as one um and I suppose for me is just to follow in the footsteps of Jane and get the scientific community interested in this mm -hmm. cancer um and generate these relationships with uh researchers um and yeah as everyone said it's just to have treatment options so everyone does have a fair chance at beating it well, thank you so much to all our panelists for participating today and for all the incredible work you do outside of this panel to, to further the research and awareness and for rare ovarian cancers. Um, this is such a big topic. There's only so much we can get to in one session. So we really intended for this to just be a starting point of an ongoing conversation. Um, the recorded video of this panel discussion will be available along with all the presentations that were given, all the resources that were shared. Um, it will be available directly on this platform starting at 4 p.m. UTC today. So you'll be able to download and keep them on file for reference. This panel video will also be uploaded to YouTube as well. Um, we hope that you'll go back to it um, continually for resources and information um, and, and continue to think, talk, and take action on rare ovarian cancers in order to bring more inclusion and equity to these patient populations and to give them hope in terms of progress on awareness and research and funding and support and more. Um, so thank you again to all the panelists. Next, you are going to have the opportunity to learn about what is on the horizon internationally. Um, you can join World Ovarian Cancers Program Director and Every Woman Study Lead, Frances Reed, at our next session. And she will be speaking to experts from the International Cancer Benchmarking Partnership about other recent developments in ovarian cancer. 
and you can join that session by clicking on the sessions tab on the left hand side of your screen. And again, thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and viewed this. And thank you so much to our panelists. And thank you to World Ovarian Cancer Coalition for hosting this panel discussion and bringing light to it, a crucially important area of unmet need. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.